So we are in chapter 50, right? Book of Isaiah. Now let me warn you, my friends. You know, often we get into a Bible study with Chuck Missler, and we get into way out left field kind of stuff. And I have to admit that I sometimes, you know, sort of look for mischief and things, and it's kind of fun. But in Isaiah, you don't need to. Isaiah is going to get on his own <laughs> pretty wild stuff. So um, to back away from the book for a minute and just get the overview, the first 35 chapters are of a certain style, a very what I'll call an Old Testament style, a lot of judgments of nations and, and what I sometimes call a dirge with little nuggets thrown in indeed, but still it's heavy stuff. Then there's a four-chapter interlude that is historical, 36 through 39. Same material as in Second Kings. In fact, this, people believe this passage in Second Kings was written by Isaiah. But now we, we hit chapter 40, we're at a turning point, change of style. Very, very messianic. Increasingly so. Orchestrated like a symphony. A little hint of a theme. And a little later, it surfaces again a little louder, and then louder, and it's got coming. The crescendo is going to be chapter 53. And I, I will we'll probably hit that next week. It'll be a suitable climax. We'll need a break <laughs> after chapter 53. Some scholars call it the Holy of Holies of the Old Testament. Chapter 50 and 51 and 52 are building up to that climax. So be prepared for some interesting stuff. Book of Isaiah. Written, of course, by Isaiah. And again, just to remind you, and I mention this because there may be new people here, don't let anyone sell you that there were two Isaiahs. That's utter nonsense. How do I know that? From John 12. John 12 quotes from Isaiah 6 and Isaiah 53 and attributes them both to the same Isaiah. So those of you that have heard these pseudo-intellectual tales of two Isaiahs, dismiss it as intellectual arrogance. I've come to the conclusion the more PhDs you see after a name, each one is a sign of insecurity. Piled higher and deeper, someone says. Somebody else says it means phenomenally dumb, but whatever. <laughs> Your guide to the Bible is the Bible. It's not Chuck Missler or some guy on the TV or the radio. Your guide to the Bible is the Bible, the Holy Spirit. And there isn't any heresy I've run into that isn't anticipated by the Holy Spirit specifically. Who wrote the five books of Moses? Moses did. Jesus said so. Quotes from each of the five and tributes to Moses. Don't even waste your time with that foolishness. It sounds good. It sounds intellectual. Anyway, chapter 50, thus saith the Lord. Boy, that's the introduction. When that comes across, the prophet is speaking for God. Thus saith the Lord. Where is the bill of your mother's divorcement or whom I have put away? Now, the Lord is dealing with here is an idiom that is used by some of the other prophets. Hosea speaks of Israel, the nation, as the adulterous wife of Jehovah, or Yahweh. It's an idiom used of the nation. She is spoken of as the wife that is unfaithful because she went whoring after false gods. That's the linguistic tie together. But in, particularly in Hosea, but in other places too, that idiom is used of the nation. And indeed, there is a sense in which that is obviously appropriate. But God here is making the point. He hasn't abandoned them. He says, where is the bill of your brother's divorcement? Or have I put, uh, put away? Or which of my creditors is it to whom I have sold you? He's implying that he'd be justified in doing so. The way Israel has responded to God, he'd be justified in getting rid of them. Moses recommended it. You gave me these people. At one time, he was a little frustrated with them. Another time, he was willing to give up a salvation for them. Only two people in my, know, my knowledge of the Bible would do that. Moses said at one time, Paul said nothing. He says, if it were possible, he'd give up his salvation for Israel. I'll let the people who don't believe in eternal security wrestle with that one. He said, if it were possible. Interesting, isn't it? I don't believe God offers a salvation that is not eternal. Anyone who doesn't believe in eternal security hasn't done his homework on the cross. What really happened on the cross. But that's another subject. Of which of my creditors is it to whom I have sold you? He's being, of course... Uh, in a sense, facetious. Behold, for your iniquities have ye sold yourselves, and for your transgressions is your mother put away. Figures of speech, but again, it's not God is doing it. It's your iniquities. You've chosen that role is what God is saying. Wherefore, when I came, was there no man? When I called, was there none to answer? Is my hand shortened at all that it cannot redeem? 
or have I no power to deliver? Behold, at my rebuke I dry up the sea, and I make the rivers a wilderness. Their fish stink because there is no water and die for thirst. Isaiah is graphic when he wants to be. I clothe the heavens with blackness, and I make sackcloth their covering. That's the figure of speech that is not unique to Isaiah. The Holy Spirit does that in a number of places. Jeremiah 4.28, Ezekiel 32.18, Joel 2.10.3.15, Matthew 24.29, Mark 13.24, Luke 21.25, Revelation 6.12. By the way, how many are those? Seven, good guess, good guess. Isn't that interesting? I'm always fascinated with structure. Not that it's a big deal. It just shows the fingerprint of the Holy Spirit in design. We obviously, it won't serve our purpose to go through all of those, but it might be instructive to take a couple of them. Obviously, the Matthew 24 and Mark 13 and Luke 21 are passages from the Olivet Discourse. Let's just take the Matthew 24 passage to give you a flavor of what I'm saying is in all of these, in effect. Matthew 24, 29. Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, the moon shall not give its light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heaven shall be shaken. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. So there's a prophetic sign. Watch for it. I'm kidding, of course. That's, has that happened? There are those that say this, Matthew 24, is already fulfilled. The abomination of desolation happened in 70 A.D. Well, if that's the case, there's an awful lot of other things that seem to have to be allegorized. No, no. Abomination of desolation has not happened yet. It is about to happen. I mean, that is, it's yet future. And we're talking about here is after the tribulation. Now, we might also see the same kind of language in Revelation chapter 6. I'm just picking a couple out of the seven that I rattled off. But let's take Revelation chapter 6. Picking up at verse 12, And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal. The Son of Man has the seven-sealed book in his hand. He's opening the seals. He's opened five of them. And when he gets to the sixth seal, Lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth. There's that phrase again. The sackcloth of air. And the moon became like blood. And the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs when she is shaken of by a mighty wind. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together. There's that phrase again. Idioms from tensor calculus, talking about the very curvilinear aspect of space, strangely enough, here, when it's rolled together. And every mountain and island were moved out of their places. Interesting allusion to fig trees. I'll let you run with that one. But notice the sackcloth of hair, the same idiom that Isaiah uses here in chapter 50, verse 3. I clothe the heavens with blackness and make the sackcloth their covering. Interesting phrase. I don't mean to make too much of these things, but I think it's fascinating to see the vocabulary of the Holy Spirit pervade Isaiah, eight centuries before Christ was born, or the book of Revelation by John. You see his craftsmanship, his handiwork shows through. Dramatic, dramatic changes on the horizon. But these things occur at the end of the 70th week of Daniel, the climax of the day of Jehovah, or the day of Yahweh, if you will, the day of the Lord. End of the tribulation. That's at the end of the seven-year period, the last half of which is the tribulation. The tribulation is not seven years, it's three and a half years, the last half of the 70th week of Daniel. And for lots of reasons, the 70th week of Daniel can't start until some other circumstances occur which have to follow the rapture, at least in one person's view. Don't take my word for it. Check it out. But for what it's worth, that's the, the viewpoint I hold. Verse 4, the Lord God hath given me the tongue of the learned or disciples, that I should know how to speak a word in season to him who is weary. He awaketh morning by morning, he waketh mine ear to hear like the learned or like the disciple. The Lord God hath given me the tongue of the learned. Has the Lord given you the tongue of the learned? You know, it's interesting, the book of Acts, just to pick one of many, many examples, but let's just take one as an example. Philip is in Samaria, having a revival. Things are going great. People are coming to the Lord. It's fabulous. The Lord says, go down to Gaza, to the wilderness. Philip doesn't say why. I mean, everything's going well here. You want to go out the de- you know, desert? No. He, doesn't, he just goes, right? When he gets there, he finds the Ethiopian treasurer. Big entourage. The guy was accountable for all the wealth of Ethiopia. 
he didn't travel alone. We always see little sketches in Sunday school books of this guy in a chariot. Hey, there was a caravan, bodyguards, a whole entourage. And this guy apparently had visited Jerusalem. What did he find in Jerusalem? Dead formalism. Emptiness. Procedures without meaning. They gave him a tour. He, a guy like that, they gave him the grand tour, right? Showed him the treasures of the temple. I always like to visualize him saying, well, how come this is torn here from the top to bottom? But that's another. <laughs> but he came away apparently discouraged, but he apparently did come away. If he didn't have it before, he apparently acquired in Jerusalem some uh, scrolls of the Old Testament. All of them, or at least anyway, he was reading Isaiah. Reading Isaiah 53, it turns out, the one we're going to study next week. And uh, Philip has the guts, the chutzpah, if I may, <laughs> to go to him and say, do you understand what you're reading? He says, how can I, unless I be guided? Has him come up, and, and Philip shows him the Messiah out of Isaiah 53. Could you have done that? See, one of the things, you know, we always talk about the idea that, okay, you know, to really be a witness for the Lord, you have to be open to it. You've got to respond to his call and so forth. Great. Something else you got to do that we often sort of overlook. Philip had done his homework. Philip knew Isaiah 53. He was able, probably, and obviously a lot more. That happened to be what the guy needed, and that happened to be what Philip was able to do. Now you can say, well, gee, the Holy Spirit enlightened him. Yeah, I'm sure he did, and yet don't dismiss the fact that he'd done his homework. The Lord God hath given me the tongue of the learned, that I should know how to speak a word in season to him who is weary. Among the many things we'll talk about tonight, I want to leave that thought with you. Have you done your homework? There's no cliche on the street. They say that luck is when opportunity meets preparation. Well, how do you get lucky? Be prepared. The opportunities are fun. Are you prepared? Have you done your homework? Have you done your homework? It's not a spectator sport, my friends. It's a grand adventure. That means you participate. Then you participate. Lord God, have given me the tongue of the learned that I should know how to speak a word in season. Oh, a word in season. To him who is weary. Boy, I can't tell you what a word in season can mean when you're weary. As you know, we've gone through a pretty tough year. I was greeted in the back by an old friend, and he made an interesting observation. He says, Chuck, I've known you for a long time. I've never seen you happier. He's absolutely I've never been more broke. I've never worked harder. But we've never been happier. And uh, praise God. But boy, what, what the encouragement of an old friend means. And the letters I've gotten from you people. Incredible. Incredible. I can't tell you what that means. Speak a word in season to him who is weary. He waketh morning by morning. He waketh mine ear to hear like the learned. Morning by morning is actually a Hebrew phrase meaning continually, but that's okay. We get the, we get the gist of it. The Lord God hath pierced mine ear, or open, but pierced my ear. And I was not rebellious, neither turned backward. Piercing of the ear. This isn't speaking of opening the ear so you can hear better, although that wouldn't hurt the meaning, but that's not what I think it says. I think the piercing of the ear refers to something else. It has to do with a procedure. It alludes to a procedure where, in those days, if you were in debt and you indentured yourself in servitude to pay the debt, your servitude would end at one of two occasions, either when you paid your contract out or if the Jubilee year fell. And that, of course, probably reflected the contract because they all knew when that was supposed to happen. So the point is, is that at that point, you in theory would be free to go. However, in real life, it turned out often the servant by then was so, so enjoyed the hospitality of the household that he voluntarily chose to serve the house for the rest of his life. And they called that kind of a servant a bond slave. It was a, it was a position of merit. The ceremony that established the relationship was to take an awl, or what you and I might call an ice pick, a sharp instrument, and pierce the ear to the doorpost of the house. You girls do it all the time, don't you, right? Maybe you don't do it to a doorpost, you know, the idea of the symbolism was that the person became bonded to the house, the household, see? And so uh, then he became what's called a bond slave, or in the Greek, the doulos. And, and uh, being pierced, they often, uh, you know, they'd wear a ring. It was a, it was a, it was a badge of merit. A, a, it was rank. He wasn't a menial servant 
Of servitude, he was a bond slave. He wore that with pride. And it's interesting that Paul and John both use the term bond slave of themselves, bond slave of Jesus Christ. It's interesting the book of Revelation was not written to the saints. Well, it was, but it was really written to the doulos, the bond servants of Jesus Christ. Are you a bond servant? Are you really a bond servant? Have you given yourself to the servitude of the Lord, Lordship of Jesus Christ? See, then the Lord God hath pierced mine ear, and I was not rebellious, neither turned backward. Okay, now I'd like to pause here, and uh, before we get into a solution, I'd like to ex- explore a bit the problem. Turn with me for some review to Luke chapter 24. It's interesting how in some of these familiar stories, there are issues that are troublesome, that, are, that leave us a little um, disturbed at times. Luke chapter 24, we of course have the resurrection in the first 12 verses, the morning, what we call Easter morning. And then in uh, verse 13, picking up at about verse 13, we have the famous event that I'm so fond of called the Emmaus Road Experience. Two disciples are on their way to Emmaus, which is about seven mile walk. It's quite a walk. As they walked along, they talked. And it's interesting that as they were talking to each other, Jesus himself joins them. But verse 16 has a strange phrase that none of us know what it means. But their eyes were holden that they should not recognize him. What does that mean? I have no idea. Some scholars say, well, they were supernaturally veiled, so they couldn't see who Christ was. Well, that's a possibility. I don't reject it. But I am tri- I'm intrigued because these two disciples were disciples. They're not of the twelve, perhaps, but they were followers of Jesus Christ. In fact, they're quite upset because they're walking along and they're really blue. They're really down. They're really discouraged over the events of the recent days. And Jesus says to them, What manner of communication are these that you have with one another as you walk and are sad? What's the problem, guys? One of them, whose name was Cleopas, answering, said to him, Art thou only a stranger in Jerusalem? Hast thou not known the things which are come to pass in these days? And Jesus says, all the, What things? <laughs> you know, like what's new, you know? <laughs> what things? Jesus is very... I find it very amusing here because he talks about himself later in the third person. The Lord Jesus Christ talking about himself in the third person. I think it's interesting. He said, what things? He said to them, concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and have crucified him. And we'd hoped that it had been he who would have redeemed Israel. And besides all this, today is the third day since these things were done. Yea, and certain women also in our company amazed us who were early at the sepulcher. They found not his body. They came saying, they'd also seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. And certain of those who were with us went to the sepulcher and found it even as the women had said, but him they saw not. So they recount to this stranger a summary of the depressing events, as far as they're concerned, of the last few days. And the more I read this, the more puzzled I am. Were they followers of Jesus Christ? And he's standing there. Why didn't they recognize him? They don't know who he is. He's a stranger. He's standing right there. They don't know who he is. Hey, stranger, don't you know what's going on? Hey, let me tell you. And they explain to him uh, what was going on. Verse 25, Then he said unto them, O foolish ones and slow of heart to believe, all that the prophets have spoken... Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? I love that phrase. Here's Christ talking to them, third person. Haven't you guys done your homework? Then, beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded them in all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. And they drew near unto the village to which they went, and he made as though he would have gone further. But they constrained him, saying, Abide with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is far spent. And he went in to tarry with them. So here's a guy they spent seven miles walking with, and he gave them an Old Testament Bible study on prophecy. Don't ever apologize for an inappropriate interest in prophecy. You guys are prophecy nuts. Yes, we are. Fanatics. Why? Because the first thing Jesus Christ did after his resurrection was to give an Old Testament prophecy Bible study. 
But then a strange thing came to pass that he sat eating with them. He took bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to them. That's strange. I thought he was the guest. And their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished out of their sight. Their eyes were opened. Now, what happened? Some scholars validly say, well, whatever supernatural thing was veiling him was removed, and now saw who he was. That's, I can't quarrel with that. But there's another view that I tend to lean toward, that they, when they saw him break the bread, something happened to let them realize who it was that was sitting at the table. And the conjecture is, it's a conjecture, I want to emphasize that, is that they, saw, they probably saw the nail prints in his wrists. Or we say in his hands, but actually the wrists. Interesting. Why did they not recognize him at first? Something's going on here. Okay, then we go a little further. Verse 33. You see, he van- and then immediately when they know who he is, he vanishes because he's got a date back in Jerusalem. And the uh, same hour, he turns to Jerusalem. They're all gathered, and they're ready to eat bread. And uh, verse 36, as they spoke, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and said, Peace be unto you. But they were terrified and frightened, supposed that they had seen a spirit. And I'm puzzled by that too. If they saw a spirit that looked like Christ, they might be startled, might be surprised. Why would they be frightened? Frightened of the Lord? Come on, gang. Maybe a little confused. It's been a tough time the last few days. But they're terrified and frightened. He said, why are you troubled? Why do, you, why do thoughts arise in your hearts? Behold, my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Here again, he identifies himself. He apparently needs to with his hands and his feet. As I'm, Behold, my hands and my feet, it is I myself. Handle me and see, a spirit hath not flesh and bones as ye see me. Have. He's tangible. He's not an ephemeral, you know, holographic image or something. He is tangible. You know, that's several. He said, first of all, spirit has not flesh and bones as ye see me. Let's say flesh and blood, flesh and bones as ye see me. have. And we had thus spoken, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while, they yet believed, while they yet believed not for joy and wondered, he said to them, have you anything to eat? <laughs> you know, I, I, I thought you're one of the mill ghosts. says, hey, I'm hungry. You got something to eat. You know? No, no. He's tangible. It's a resurrection body. But there's something about him that bothers them. He has to show them his wounds to confirm who it is that's standing before him. Rather interesting. Let's pop over to John chapter 20. And again, we're in a post-resurrection uh, period here. Mary Magdalene, verse 11, Mary stood outside of the sepulcher weeping. And as she wept, she stooped down and looked in the sepulcher and seeth two angels sitting, one at the head and the other feet, where the body of Jesus had lain. They said unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? She said unto them, Because they have taken away my Lord. I love that. My Lord. Not the Lord. My Lord. Can you say that? Is he your Lord? And I know not where they have laid him. And when she had thus said, she turned herself back and saw Jesus standing and knew not that it was Jesus. This is Mary Magdalene. She worshipped him like probably none other. Like probably none other. And she didn't know it was Jesus. Jesus said unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? Whom seekest thou? She... Supposing him to be the gardener. That interests me for several reasons. First of all, she just assumes he's some kind of hireling. She doesn't know who he is. It's also interesting that the first gardener blew it. A guy by the name of Adam. <laughs> this gardener undid what Adam screwed up. Kind of interesting phrase. She thought he was a gardener. I like that. She thinks God saith unto him, Sir, if thou have borne him from here, tell me where thou hast laid him, and I will take him away. And I'd like to see that. This kid, this gal, is going to take the body. Show me where he is. I'm going to take him away. I don't know where she's going to take him. But you can just see where she's coming from. Then verse 16, Jesus saith unto her, Mary. She turned herself and said unto him, Rabboni, which is to say, Master. Interesting passage question I have for you tonight is 
I'm puzzled that the, the, the disciples on the Emmaus Road don't recognize him. In the upper room, they don't recognize him because he, he uh, has to show them his, his wounds to, to verify his identity. Here's Mary, who loved him, doesn't recognize him in the garden until she really hears his voice, apparently. My conjecture is that it was the voice that tipped her off, but something's wrong here. Turn to the next chapter, chapter 21. It's funny, when, you, when you're under stress, you usually, and it's good hygiene, emotional hygiene, is to retreat to something that you're good at. You've got a big defeat at, 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 you know, of some kind, and you should do something, whether it's a game of racquetball or a game of chess or something. Do something that you can win at. It's good, good therapy. Well, the disciples are unglued. They've had a tough time. It's been a time of confusion and setback and whatever. And uh, so they're gathering in confusion. And Simon Peter says, I go fishing. Understandable. Fisher, he was a fisherman. He loved fishing. And that's something he knew how to do. So they're going to go fishing. And they all say, hey, we'll go with you. They went forth, entered a boat immediately. And that night, it's an all-night deal, they caught nothing. When morning was now come, Jesus stood on the shore, but his disciples knew not that it was Jesus. That's interesting. Here again. Now, that's understandable because he's on the sea sh on the shore, right? Silhouette maybe in the morning mist. Who knows? And they see somebody and, hey, guys, you catch anything? No. Put your net on the other side of the boat. Now, hang on. You know, that, how do the fish know? I reminded when... Uh, my kids were very small. My business partner, Don, Don Rage and I were the guys that brought Walter Martin on the West Coast. Don and I were doing things in those days together. And Don, Don called me and said, uh, hey, let's take the kids fishing. Let's go Saturday morning, go out to the Newport Pier and just do something. Hey, good idea, Don, why not? So we got up, we're going to get up early in the morning, five or whatever, and go out there and, and do that. Well, I mentioned to the bo two boys, two small boys, hey, we was like, oh, that's neat, Dad. And then Lisa overheard this, little, their younger sister. Oh, can I go? Of course, the, that was very popular with the boys. You, know, you take girls fishing, you know. Sure, she can come along. Oh, Dad, does she? Oh, you know, anyway, we all pile in. We go out to the Newport Pier. And uh, we get buy a bucket of bait and cook up a fish. And Lisa, who must have been, I don't know how she, I forgot how old she was, maybe five or six, throws it over the side of the pier. And right now, like in 10 seconds, she gets a 28-inch halibut. <laughs> well... <laughs> And, of course, they drop the net down there, bring it up. And, of course, she's, this is, she thought fishing's pretty good. That's a lot of fun, you know. <laughs> and uh, it was fun to watch her disappointment when she did the second time and didn't come right away. I thought every 10 seconds you're supposed to catch a big fish. And, of course, it, it, we have a picture of her, and it's as big as she is. She, we had to help her hold it next to her to get a picture. She, it was a big deal for her. She had a wonderful time. It was great. But the reason I bring up the story, it was fascinating, because then after the, we got the kids reset up again with their lines and their tail lines, Don and I went down to the end to get a cup of coffee and just talk. But as you walk down, both of us notice something interesting. Here's the Newport Pier, populated with these older guys that do that every day. You know, they're out there. That's what they do. That's their thing. They fish all the time. Most of them moved over to our side of the pier. <laughs> this little kid got the hell. It must be better there. And, and I remember sitting, I don't, I don't, I don't know actually about fishing, but I couldn't help but think, I, I found myself thinking about how do the fish know one side of the, I mean, you know, the whole thing intrigued me. What also intrigued me was one guy that I overheard. He packed up his tackle and went off the pier mumbling. I've been at this place every day for a year, and I have never caught a fish like that. And he, he gave up. He went home. And I thought, boy, that's, <laughs> human nature is interesting. So I always think of that here, because here, here they, on the one hand, didn't catch anything. Well, put your net on the other side of the boat. Now, John's the perceptive one that caused him to realize this was the Lord, because this happened before. It's a trademark, so to speak. So John had realizes Christ. Of course, John does the analysis. Peter takes the action. Peter's my kind of guy. Ready, fire, then aim, right? It's the Lord. Okay, and then when Peter heard it was the Lord, he dove in and swam ashore. Peter swims ashore, and when he gets there, Verse 9, as soon as they were come to land, they saw a fire of coals and the fish laid on it and bread. Baked bread, made breakfast. That's what the Lord did while he was waiting for these guys to bring in the catch. Kind of interesting. Jesus said to them, bring the fish that you uh, now have caught. Simon Peter went up and drew the net and so forth. Then we get to this verse 12. Boy, I don't know what verse 12 means. Jesus said, I'm coming dine. Okay. 
And then we've got this very strange sentence. And none of the disciples dare ask him, Who art thou, knowing it was the Lord? You say, Chuck, what does that mean? I have no idea. Let me tell you what I mean. You and your spouse are driving to a, a banquet about a, an hour away. And about half an hour after driving, you turn to your wife and say, By the way, did you turn off the stove? If she says yes... We keep on driving. Enjoy the enjoy the evening, right? Suppose she says, I'm sure I did. What do you do? You turn around and go check, right? Because there's something, you know, if I say yes, affirmatively, period, no modifiers, you take it, right? Accept it. But if I say, I'm sure I did. You're not sure, are you? You see? That's what I hear when I see this. And none of the disciples dare ask him, Who art thou? Well, first of all, why would it occur to them? It apparently occurred to them, but they didn't dare ask. Because they knew it was the Lord. What's going on on the Emmaus Road? They don't recognize it. In the upper room, they're frightened. Mary Magdalene, who loved him, didn't recognize him. Something's going on. Now, I want to demonstrate something to you. That the New Testament is in the Old Testament concealed. And the Old Testament is in the New Testament revealed. Turn to Isaiah chapter 50. We know a lot about the crucifixion. Most of what you and I know about the crucifixion physically, we know from the gospel accounts how Jesus was taken and abused by the Romans. They made fun of him. They spit on him. They mocked him. They put on a crown of thorns. They, the soldiers, had their way with him. They abused him and scourged him and the whole routine. In Isaiah 53, which we'll take up next time we'll get it, 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 later on, it, it mentions that they beat him up so badly that he no longer looked like a man. The Hebrew is not translated in the English. The King James translator tries tried to spare you the real impact of the Hebrew. We'll take that up when we get uh, next week, that part of it. But the abuse, the physical abuse of Jesus Christ at the crucifixion is something that with all the vividness of detail in the New Testament is still incomplete. There is a detail that for some reason is not mentioned in the New Testament and probably fortunately is omitted in the movies and renderings you see as an art form of the crucifixion. I want you to notice verse 6, which I believe is prophetic of our suffering servant that Isaiah is building up to. I gave my back to the smiters and my cheeks to them that plucked off the hair. I hid not my face from shame and spitting. Simply put, they ripped off his beard. This is very vivid to me. I can remember when I was chairman of one of the major companies that was an electronics business. I had a software team, and the head of my software group was a guy that happened to always wear a big, full beard. I knew him that way. I worked with him for over a year and a half, face-to-face. Every day I'd see him. Got my name of Joe. Then one day, for because he apparently had some kind of skin infection, he had to shave his beard off for something that he was involved in, and um, one day he came to work without his beard. Now, this is a guy I worked with every day, personally. He came down the hall. I was coming down to my, going down the hall to my office. I did not wreck. I thought he was a stranger, somebody visiting the plant. Fortunately for me, somebody else also came down the hall and said, hey, Joe, and asked him some question, and it triggered. I realized, my goodness, that's Joe. And I realized I wouldn't have. I would have been really embarrassed because... It was a very full beard. I used to see him that way. Without the beard, he looked so different than I was used to that to me, he was a stranger. And that event dramatized to me what I suspect, this is all conjecture, what I suspect was going on. Did Jesus Christ bear the scars of his humiliation in his post-resurrection body? Absolutely. That's what the nail prints in the hands and the wound in the side are all about, right? Right? 
And by the way, while I'm on that subject, let me take another excursion. <laughs> Turn to Zechariah 13. Another insight that has to do with all this. When I was a teenager, I happened to be on a prophecy memory kick. I was a, uh, I happened to run, I came across 13.6, Zechariah 13, verse 6, where it says, And one shall say unto them, What are these wounds in thine hands? And one shall answer, I mean, and he shall answer, those with which I was wounded in the house of my friends. I said, wow, wounds in the hands, that's a prophecy thing. I, in those days, would take a little card, and I'd write the verse on one side and the reference to the other and put it in my little group to try to, you know, learn it. I was on that, I was on the kick in those days. But then as I started to try to memorize it, I began to realize, I don't know what that says. Wait a minute, come on here. It says what? It says, uh, one shall say, and what are these wounds in thine hands? Okay. Then he shall answer, those with which I was wounded in the house of my friends. Well, I had a problem right there because I could not visualize a group of timbers up on a, on a hill in Judea, surrounded by Roman soldiers, driving these nails into his hands on this hill as being the house of his friends. Now, you can use very gracious idioms, idioms regarding the Roman soldiers, but I would not call that the house of his friends. But then I had another problem. What are these wounds in the hands? Those with which I was wounded in the house of my friends. And then I realized what this is really talking about. I remembered how in the Gospels, when he appears that first night, they're all shocked and surprised, right? But there's one that's missing. Remember Thomas? He wasn't present that night. And so the next day or whenever, they ran the time. Hey, Thomas, boy, you should have been at the Bible study last night. Let me tell you who showed up, you know. And he probably said something like, yeah, yeah, I hear you. But unless I put my fingers in his nail prints and my hand on his side, I can't buy that story. So next time they're all together, Thomas with him. And once again, Jesus appears. And this time he says, okay, Thomas. Okay. Thomas falls on his knees and says, my Lord and my God. Jesus says, Thomas, you've seen and believed. Blessed are they who have not seen and believed. Right? You all know the story. I think Zechariah writing 800 years before Christ was born, translated into Greek three centuries before he was born, listen to the voice of Jesus. What are these wounds in thine hands? Those with which I was wounded in the house of my friends. What wounded Jesus Christ was not the spikes driven by the Romans in the spirit of Sean, but here, what hurt him was Thomas's doubt, his unbelief. That's what wounded him. Interesting, interesting element. Does Jesus Christ bear the scars of his humiliation? Yes, we see that in the Gospels. What we are not prepared for, what would never occurs to us unless we read Isaiah very carefully, is that among the abuses of the Romans, they tore off his beard. What does that do to a guy? Yes, it heals or scar tissue. Does that mean he's disfigured? It's interesting, when we get to Revelation chapter 6, let's turn back to Revelation chapter, excuse me, chapter 5. Revelation chapter 5. John is transported through time ahead in heaven. In time, I saw on the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll written within and on the backside, sealed with seven seals. Now, if you've done your homework, Jeremiah 32 in the book of Ruth, you know it's a title deed, apparently of the whole earth. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and to loose the seals? And no man in heaven or in earth, neither under the earth. That in itself is an interesting dichotomy. Neither no man in heaven nor on earth nor either under the earth is able to open the scroll, neither to look upon it. It had to be a man. That's interesting. It had to be a kinsman of Adam. We're talking about redemption here, the laws of redemption. It's a title deed. Had to be a kinsman. No man in heaven nor on earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the scroll, neither to look upon it. And I wept much, or literally I sobbed convulsively, because no man was found worthy to open it and to read the book, neither to look upon it. You and I don't understand what's going on, but John did. John understood the significance that if no man could be found, we were all in trouble. But that's the generalization. Now we have the exception. One of the elders said unto me, Weep not. Behold, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the Root of David. Those are both titles of whom? Jesus Christ. The Lion of the tribe of Judah, the Root of David, hath prevailed or overcome. 
to open the scroll and to loose its seven seals. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne of the four living creatures and in the midst of the elders stood what? The lion? Yes, but by another title. The lion of the tribe of Judah is one title. Here's another title. The lamb, as it had been slain. That's interesting. When Jesus Christ first appears publicly, John the Baptist says, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. That's, his, that's a very Jewish title. The Lamb of the Passover Lamb. What's the Lamb? Why is it a Lamb? Why is it, what's the destiny of the Lamb? To be slain. But here we see the Lamb as it had been slain. Having seven hordes and seven eyes, and those are, for, those are that's a quote for Isaiah 11, and so forth. <laughs> Somebody once said, there's only one man-made thing in heaven. That's Christ's scars. It's interesting. Someone told me a story of a little girl whose mother happened to be badly disfigured, had a very disfigured face. And the little girl, when she went through the, the low grades in school, the, the lower grades, the, the other girls made fun of her because she had this mother with a weird face. You know how kids are. They're often very thoughtless. When the little girl grew up to be old enough, the mother explained to her that one reason she has these scars is that when she was an infant, there was a fire in the apartment, and she had to go through that to rescue the little girl to save her life, and in, in that rescue, she endured some very serious burns that left the disfigurement. And from that day on, the little girl was no longer embarrassed about her mother because those scars were a demonstration to her how much her mother loved her. You and I are going to see the Lord Jesus Christ in eternity. The question I don't know the answer to, will we see the nail prints? Will we see the wound in the side? Will we see the results of his disfigurement at the hands of the Romans? Are the marks of his humiliation his glory? Just what did it cost him that you and I might live? Because who put him on the cross? I did. You did. That was the price he had to pay. Now, very candidly, the real cost is far beyond any of that that we can comprehend. The physical suffering, brutal though it may be, is probably a small part of the equation. You and I have no concept of what it means for someone who is perfect, who is righteous, who has never sinned, to be made sin for us. We have no concept of that. We may study it intellectually, theologically. We may try to approach some comprehension of it, but there's no way we can understand what it cost him. What, it, what caused him to scream out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? The first words of the cross, first line of Psalm 22. His last words on the cross is the way Psalm 22 closes. It is finished. In the Greek, to tell us die, which also can be translated paid in full. The price of your sin and mine is eternal separation from God. And somehow, in the many dimensions of Christ's existence, he paid that price. He did the whole job. You can't add to it. He did everything. The destiny that he purchased for you is available for the asking. It is arrogant and presumption, uh, uh, presumptuous of us to add, try to add anything to that. He did the whole job. Your salvation has been purchased, paid for by him. But at what a cost a cost we, you and I can probably never fully understand. And yet, the few things we do understand should drive us to tears. 
that our Lord not only bears some nail prints on his wrists and his side, but had me suffer facial disfigurement for eternity. He didn't become a man, by the way, for 33 years. When you first study the Bible, the amazing discovery is that God became man. Wow, that's a wild idea. And we absorb that and try to get it into our being. But then as we study further in the book of Romans and elsewhere, and we discover what righteousness really is from the Torah and from God's laws and from, from both Christ's and Paul's and John's interpretation of them, we understand what righteousness really means. Then we begin to realize where man stands with respect to that righteousness. And we begin to become aware of the gulf between the standard God requires for fellowship and the, and the standard where we're at. Then we're confronted with an even more amazing discovery, not that God became man, but the amazing thing that you and I can grasp tonight, the miracle right now as we speak is that there is a man on the throne of God. Wow. What does that mean? Well, that's what Revelation 6 through 19 lays out because he's going to claim possession of that which he purchased in two stages. Us first and then Israel second. Back to Isaiah. I gave my back to the smiters and my cheeks to them that plucked off the hair. I hid not my face from the shame and spitting. Just a little glimpse that Isaiah gives you this night to think about. Verse 7, For the Lord God will help me, therefore shall I not be confounded. Therefore have I set my face like a flint, and I know that I shall not be ashamed. He is near who justifieth me. Who will contend with me? Let us stand together. Who is mine adversary? Let him come near to me. Behold, the Lord God will help me. Who is he that shall condemn me? Lo, they are all. They shall all grow old like a garment. The moth shall eat them up. Who is among you that feareth the Lord, that obeyeth the voice of the servant? that walketh in darkness and hath no light. Let him trust in the name of the Lord and stay upon his God. Behold all ye that kindle a fire, that compass yourselves about with sparks. Walk in the light of your fire and the sparks that ye have kindled. This shall ye have of mine hand. Ye shall lie down in sorrow. The humiliation of God's Holy One. Interesting. But we'll keep moving here. Chapter 51. Hearken to me, ye that follow after righteousness, ye that seek the Lord. Look down unto the rock from which ye are hewn, and to the hole of the pit from which ye are digged. Look unto Abraham your father, and unto Sarah who bore you, for I called him alone, that is, as one, and blessed him and increased him. For the Lord shall comfort Zion. He will comfort all her waste places. He shall make her wilderness like Eden and her desert like the garden of the Lord. Joy and gladness shall be found in it, thanksgiving and the voice of melody. Strange passage, you know. The more you study, the more you realize we don't know much about Eden. We speak of the Garden of Eden. That was a garden east of Eden, huh? But well, where was the Garden of Eden? The traditional sites are always around Mesopotamia, the Fertile Crescent and all of that. That seems to be the, what we call the cradle of civilization. Whoever well, that was the Garden of Eden, where was Eden? West of there, right? What's west of there? Israel. I've always wondered. I have no real basis for this, just a off-the-wall conjecture. But I've often wondered, is God's peculiar interest in the land Something to do with its history. Because, you know, it's whole covenant with Israel. You, you read the Old Testament, and it's all tangled up in the land, his land, unique piece of property, land of Israel. Why? Why is that so special? Lots of neat places around the world. Why, what makes that so special? God's put his name on it. It's his. And it fascinates me as I read, you know, Ezekiel 28, and we find the, the origin of Satan. We find Eden there described very differently, different terms colored lights. Precious stones were their way of describing colored light. Strange, totally different existence. We have no idea what Eden was like prior to Genesis 3. We only know it all post-curse. wonder what it was like before the curse. Was it only in three-dimensional? Or the more? Probably. Interesting. 
Anyway, he's going to make her wilderness like Eden, whatever that means, and her desert like the garden of the Lord. Joy and gladness shall be found at thanksgiving in the voice of Billy. Hearken unto me, my people, and give ear unto me, O my nation, for a law shall proceed from me, and I will make my justice to rest for a light of the peoples. My righteousness is near, my salvation is gone forth, and mine arms shall judge the peoples. The coasts shall wait upon me, and on mine arm they shall trust. Lift up your eyes to the heavens, and look upon the earth beneath, for the heavens shall vanish away like smoke. And the earth shall grow old like a garment, and they that dwell therein shall die in like manner, but my salvation shall be forever, and my righteousness shall not be abolished. Interesting. Those that dwell on the earth shall die in like manner. When you read the book of Revelation, be sensitive to the fact that there's a group of people frequently referred to called the earth dwellers, they that dwell upon the earth. And recognize that that phrase is intended to exclude you. You're always portrayed as pilgrims. You belong to another. You look for a city whose builder and maker is God. We're pilgrims. Our touch with the earth should be light, minimal. That which we need to do to subsist and keep the peace. But this isn't our home. This is not our home. The earth dwellers are, have their own destiny. And Revelation deals with that very articulately. Verse 7, hearken unto me that know righteousness, the people in whose heart is my law. Oh, what a wonderful thing. It says law in your heart. Fear not the reproach of men, neither be afraid of their revilings. Boy, how slow we are to learn that. How dare we embrace the opinions of others. What do they know? How fickle they are. How fickle they are. How meaningless it is. Fear not, neither be afraid of their revilings. For the moth shall eat them up like a garment, the worm shall eat them like wool, but my righteousness shall be forever, and my salvation from generation to generation. And I was reminded the other evening, I had an old associate of mine that uh, showed up the study, and we went off and had a cup of coffee together afterwards. Last time we were in a business deal together, it was a little tense because he was doing some things he shouldn't have been doing. Not a bad guy. He just got in over his head and did some, made some mistakes. But I could tell he was, we need to get together, and he was sort of wondering if there was some forgiveness, and that was easy. I said, hey, what's amazing? I forgot. I said, not an issue. What's amazing, as you really put life in perspective, how unimportant those things are. He looked at me kind of surprised because he was, and it was a neat evening because we had a neat reconciliation. But, it really is true. It wasn't a question of being forgiving. It was easy. The more important insight was how meaningless all those issues were of the past. It's interesting if we can just stand back and get the divine viewpoint. See, that's what the book of Job is really all about. If the book of Job is about why do the innocent suffer, it never solves the problem because it doesn't deal with that. That's never dealt with, really. What's the book of Job really all about? Maintaining the divine viewpoint. See, we're entitled in Job to an, a conversation up front that Job doesn't have the benefit of between Satan and God. So we see Job as we read it from God's point of view. See, what the real lesson of the book of Job is, that's the way we need to look at our lives, to recognize there's probably conversations we haven't heard. And it's a question of trust. Somehow, to get our eyes on the Lord and not our problems, or affairs, or setbacks, or tensions. The divine viewpoint. Awake, awake, verse 9. That phrase is going to appear three times here in verse 17 and then the opening of chapter 52. Sort of a marker, sort of a stylistic marker, if nothing else, maybe much more. Awake, awake, put on strength, O arm of the Lord. Awake as in the ancient days, in the generations of old. Was it not thou who hath cut Rahab and wounded the sea monster or dragon? The word Rahab can mean several things. It is, of course, you will all associate it with the name of a girl in Joshua. But the word Rahab actually means the proud one, and it's also used of Egypt in, in several cases. But here it says, Was it not thou who hast cut Rahab 
and I suspect this may be a, an allusion, if you will, to Egypt, and wounded the Leviathan or sea monster. And this opens up a whole other can of peas. Who is the Leviathan in the book of Job? Some of the commentators as well as a crocodile. Hey, no way does that fit in my mind. I'll let you get the Job tapes if you really want to get into it. But you can take a concordance and dig out the allusions to sea monsters, dragons, and Leviathans. And especially in Job, you'll find that in a couple of, not always, but in some of the cases, the language goes far beyond a physical creature. And there's something far deeper involved. And that may be the illusion here. But I'll leave that with you as a, a side trip for those that are inclined to spookiness. And we'll move on. Was it not thou who dried up the sea, the waters of the great deep, who hath made the depths of the sea a way for the ransom to pass over? That's kind of fun. Therefore the redeemed of the Lord shall return and come with singing unto Zion. And everlasting joy shall be upon their head. They shall obtain gladness and joy, and sorrow and mourning shall flee away. I, even I, am he who comforteth you. Who art thou, that thou shouldst be afraid of a man that shall die, and the son of a man who shall be made like grass? There's that allusion of grass again. We talked about that before. And forgettest the Lord, thy Maker, who hath stretched forth the heavens and laid the foundations of the earth that has feared continually every day because of the fury of the oppressor, as if he were ready to destroy. And where is the fury of the oppressor? The captive exile hasteneth that he may be loosed, and that he should not die in the pit, nor that his bread should fail. But I am the Lord thy God, who divided the sea, whose waves roared. The Lord of hosts is his name. And I have put my words in thy mouth, and I have covered thee in the shadow of mine hand, that I may plant the heavens and lay the foundations of the earth, and say to Zion, Thou art my people. Awake, awake, stand up, O Jerusalem, which hast drunk at the hand of the Lord the cup of his fury. Thou hast drunk the dregs of the cup of trembling and wrung them out. There is none to guide her among all the sons whom she hath brought forth. This has to do with the leaders having fled. This is also mentioned in Jeremiah 43, it's, if you remember that. Neither is there any that taketh her by the hand of all the sons that she hath brought up. These two things are come unto thee. Who shall be sorry for thee? Desolation and destruction and famine and the sword. By whom shall I comfort thee? Thy sons have fainted. They lie at the head of all the streets. And, and like, a, like an antelope in the net, they are full of fury of the Lord, the rebuke of thy God. Therefore, hear now this, thou afflicted and drunken, but not with wine. Thus saith thy Lord, thy God, who pleadeth the cause of his people, Behold, I have taken out of thine hand the cup of trembling, even the dregs of the cup of my fury. Thou shalt no more drink it again, but I will put it in the hand of those who afflict thee, who have said to thy soul, Bow down, that we may go over. And thou hast laid thy body like the ground and like the street, to those who went over. Call to Jerusalem. In trouble, but there be a time when that will be taken away. Notice the promise that God makes. He's not through with Jerusalem. He's not through with Israel. He's yet to deal with their enemies. Now what he treats us now to is a vision of Jerusalem in the kingdom age. In the kingdom age. Again, we have this interesting marker. Awake, awake. Third time it appears. Put on thy strength, O Zion, put on thy beautiful garments, O Jerusalem, the holy city, for henceforth there shall no more come unto thee the uncircumcised and the unclean. Shake thyself from the dust, arise and sit down, O Jerusalem, loose thyself from the bands of thy neck, O captive daughter of Zion. For thus saith the Lord, ye have sold yourselves for nothing, and ye shall be redeemed without money. Now that's interesting. It's fascinating as you study Leviticus through that the redemptive coin was always silver. Silver Levitically speaks of blood. Even Judas used that expression when he throws the 30 pieces of silver on the temple floor, trying to undo his bargain. He says, I behold, I have betrayed innocent blood. Blood and silver are linked as symbols together. And it's interesting, here we have the redemption coin, but not with money. We're talking not substitute or symbolic blood now in the terms of the half-shekel redemptive coin or whatever. We're talking here about the shedding of blood. In the Torah, way, way back, in fact, even way long before Moses, probably in the Garden of Eden, 
was the institution of the idea that by the shedding of innocent blood would man be covered. When Adam and Eve made their fig leaf things, God replaced those with coats of skins. In that subtle hint, we now understand, was the institution of the Levitical system teaching them, practically speaking, that it was by innocent blood being shed they would be covered. The Levitical system didn't start with Moses. It was instituted then. In Noah's time, God could speak to Noah of the clean and unclean animals. That's a Levitical distinction. It's interesting. All of this pointing to, prophetically, a cross on a hill in Judea. When Abraham is asked to act out prophecy by offering Isaac, he knew it was prophetic. He named the place, in the mount of the Lord it shall be seen. And 2,000 years later, on that very hill, some Romans erected three crosses. All the universe being judged by the death, burial, and resurrection of that person with whom we have to do. And ye shall be redeemed without money. For thus saith the Lord God, my people went down at first into Egypt to sojourn there, and the Assyrian oppressed them without cause. Well, now that's kind of interesting. We all know the story of Joseph, right? Brothers sold him into slavery. He goes down there, gets falsely accused, spends some time in prison, but then through God's intervention, rises to become the prime minister of the world. Pharaoh was the king, but his right hand was Joseph because he saw the famines coming. He saw the good years coming from the famines, and he also gave some good, sound stewardship advice. Store from the good years to take care of the bad years, and and uh, so Pharaoh puts Joseph in charge. He does it very shrewdly. He doesn't give the food away. He sells it for land and lets Pharaoh then own Egypt. Interesting. Changes tax structure that endured to modern times. But then his family moves down there, of course. The 70 bunch come down and they live there, and as time goes on, there's a pharaoh that rises that knew not Joseph, as the expression goes, right? And they become oppressed. It's interesting how the Scripture, again, my main theme is telling you how the Bible ties together. One of the most interesting commentaries on the Old Testament you have in your lap. It's called Acts chapter 7. Young guy by the name of Stephen. But here again, we've got an example of a guy who did his homework. Stephen, a deacon. He waited tables. He waited tables for the apostles. Hey, but he did his homework. He knew the Bible. Why? Because he shortly goes up before the Sanhedrin, the highest council in Judaism, and he lets them have it. And if you study Stephen's speech, you learn something very interesting. If you study the speech of Stephen, he, he recounts the whole history of the Old Testament. But if you study his speech carefully, you'll notice what his point is, is that Israel always screws up the first time. And it's the second time they finally get the message. And he builds up to Jesus Christ. They rejected Jesus Christ. But what he doesn't finish, because he can see the expressions on the Sanhedrin's face, is that they're going to re recognize him the second time. Interesting. It's an interesting speech if you study it carefully. But as you go through this, it is full of discoveries of things about the Old Testament you didn't know by reading the Old Testament. And I won't go through them all, obviously, if you want to get, get the tape on Acts 7. But I want you to notice something here. He talks about, in verse 18... He speaks of Abraham, the people grew and multiplied in Egypt, right? And then verse 18, till another king arose that knew not Joseph. Now, this isn't in Hebrew. This is in Greek in the New Testament. And the Greek does us a favor. In the English, we have another, you see. If you have a piece of toast and you ask me, could I have another piece of toast in the English? I don't know whether you mean, do you want it white or wheat? You see. In the Greek, there are two words for another. Alos and heteros. If you had a piece of white toast and you asked me for, could I have another piece of toast? You say, alos, then you want another piece of white toast. Are you with me? But if, you, if you've got a piece of white toast and you say, I want a heteros, I want another of a different kind, say. In other words, there's two ways. Another can mean another of the same kind or another that's different. Follow me? We don't do that in the English. The Greeks do. When Stephen says in verse 18, till another king arose, the word is heteros, meaning this king was of a different kind. You say, well, gee, that's a pretty subtle thing. So yes, but when I go to Isaiah, 
chapter 52, verse 4, there is an interesting discovery in verse 4 of Isaiah 52, which is confirmed, in effect, by Stephen's commentary on this. For thus saith the Lord God, my people went down at the first into Egypt to sojourn there, and the Assyrian oppressed them without cause. You mean there are pharaohs that were non Egyptian? That's right. When you study the history of the pharaohs, you discover they were not all Egyptians. In fact, one of our major authorities for the uh, ancient history of Egypt is Menaphos the priest. His documents are very well known. And he ascribes the Great Pyramid to a strange group of people called the Hyksos that came, took over the land, tore down the idols, built the pyramid, and then left. Strange, whatever they were. And there's all kinds of scholastic conjectures about all that. The point is, here we have a situation where the Pharaoh that knew not Joseph wasn't Egyptian. He was Assyrian. Well, now with that insight, we get a whole different perspective of the Exodus. When we study Pharaoh, we notice he's insecure by the number of the Hebrews. Why was he insecure? Because he wasn't Egyptian in the first place. And with the Hebrews multiplying, they had to subjugate them as slaves for fear, paranoia. Interesting. See, the Assyrian oppressed them without cause. We find out from Isaiah. Interesting how that ties together. In Exodus chapter 1, verse 8, Now there arose a new king over Egypt who knew not Joseph, and he said to, unto his people, Behold, the people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we. Come on, let us see. Well, I always assume those Egyptians, maybe not. It's a constituency that's in power. Come now, let us deal wisely with them, lest they multiply and it come to pass that when war occurs, they join also unto our enemies and fight against us, and so get them up out of this land. Therefore, they set over them taskmasters to afflict them, and, and you know the story. Interesting. Interesting. A lot going on there. Pierce. Anyway, chapter 52, verse 5. Now, therefore, what have I here, saith the Lord, what, that my people are taken away for nothing? They that rule over them to wail, saith the Lord, and, and my name continually every day is blasphemed. Therefore, my people shall know my name. Therefore, they shall know in that day that I am he who doth speak. Behold, it is I. You know, it's interesting, as we see God so jealous of his name, and we see him recount in Ezekiel and here in Isaiah his displeasure at being blasphemed, right? And he finally gets to the point where enough's enough, and he pulls the chain, right? Have you looked around lately? Talk about God being blasphemed. Boy, how long will he endure it? A while, but not much, huh? It's interesting how the book of Joshua is a model of the book of Revelation. You've heard me through this, the idea, whole idea that Yehoshua dispossessed the seven nations. Three had been put down before. There were seven left, seven nations. God took the chosen people to dispossess the land of the usurpers. Battle of Jericho with the seven trumpets, and they kept silence until the seventh day, and then they blew the trumpets. The whole, whole routine is very analogous, of course, to the structure of the book of Revelation. Every rule of the Torah was broken in the Battle of Jericho. The Ark was not supposed to go to war. It led the parade, and so on. Before he goes, he sends in two witnesses to get Rahab saved. Interesting, a Gentile. The more you study the book of Joshua, the more you begin to realize it's a model, if you will, of the book of Revelation, with the decimal point moved over, maybe. And uh, the, he finally confronts the kings under alliance, a guy by the name of Adonai Zedek, right? Lord of Righteousness is his title, arrogant title. And... Uh, he gets defeated with signs of the sun and the moon. And then the kings hide in caves and say, rocks fall on us, and so forth. Just just a real model book of Revelation. What's well, interesting that um, Joshua doesn't go into the promised land until the iniquity of the Amorites is full. Remember that from Genesis? It's interesting that another Yehoshua isn't going to dispossess the planet Earth of the usurpers until iniquity is full. Boy, are we getting there. My friend Doug tells me that there are 35,000 new VD cases per day, according to the Atlanta Center for Disease Control. 
Where years ago there were seven strains, now there are 18. And on it goes. You look all over the world, you look at, you look at the world, and you can prattle off many statistics, all kinds, and say, that, hey, it's a mess. The iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full, speaking by analogy, but boy, it's getting close. And another Yoshua is going to deal with the widespread blasphemy against God. Therefore my people shall know my name, therefore they shall know in that day that I am he who doth speak, behold, it is I. Verse 6. Verse 7. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him that bringeth good tidings, that publisheth peace, that bringeth good tidings of the good, that publisheth salvation, that saith unto Zion, Thy God reigneth. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him that bringeth good tidings. It's interesting to notice the use of idioms because in Ephesians chapter 6, we have the armor of God, right? Remember that famous passage? That is also incidentally taken from Isaiah, but it's another one. Turn to Ephesians 6. We, we can sneak in a couple of tangents here. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, right? but against principalities, powers, so forth, right? And against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Therefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Stand therefore in having your loins girded about with truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Do you see the idiom tying to 52? Same kind of idea. We always hear this presented in chapter 6 as if, because Paul at the time he's writing was apparently chained to a Roman soldier. And you often get the impression he's drawing these idioms from looking at the armor of this professional soldier. That may be true. However, I suspect he's really taking all of this from Isaiah 59, verse 17. If you pop over to Isaiah 59, we'll just take a quick peek ahead. Isaiah 59, verse 17, Isaiah says, For he put on the righteousness as a breastplate and a helmet of salvation upon his head, and he put on garments of vengeance for clothing and was clad with zeal as a cloak, and so on. There is a similarity to Ephesians 6 that I think is provocative. But anyway, getting back to 52, How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who bringeth good tidings. What are good tidings? The gospel, right? That publisheth peace and so forth. Okay, verse 8, thy watchmen, or watchers I may, they may be guardian angels, shall lift up the voice, and the voice together shall they sing, for they shall see eye to eye when the Lord shall bring again Zion. Break forth unto joy. Sing together, ye waste places of Jerusalem, for the Lord hath comforted his people. He hath redeemed Jerusalem. You know, I read these passages, I find it very hard to get into this idea that God has forsaken Israel. Boy, if there's any recurring theme throughout the entire Bible, is that God has not forsaken Israel. And yet there are people who try to sell you that the church is now Israel. That's a heresy. The Lord hath made bare his holy arm in the eyes of all the nations, and all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. Depart ye, depart, go out from there, touch no unclean thing, go out of the midst of her, be ye clean, that bear the vessels of the Lord. For ye shall not go out with haste, nor by flight, for the Lord will go before you, and the God of Israel shall be your rear guard. Fabulous, fabulous passage. That ends chapter 52 as far as you and I are concerned. Because I believe verses 13, 14, and 15 are part of what I'll call Isaiah 53. I'm going to regard the chapter break as being three verses late. Because the flow starts at verse 13, Behold my servant. And from that point on, we are going to behold the servant. The Old Testament presents the Messiah in many dimensions, many facets. The Messiah was to be an, a, a kinsman of Adam, a kinsman redeemer, a goel. So he had to be a man. But it also describes him as being a god, the son of God. Some of the rabbis like to deny that today, it, but in the Psalms and Isaiah all through there, it makes it clear that he is the son of God. He has both human, but also of deity. Now, it also describes it to be a ruler and a leader and all those things. Great. But it also describes something that Israel was blinded to, and that is that he was to be killed. Daniel chapter 9 says that the Messiah will be karat, that is executed for a capital crime, but not for himself. And the people of the princes shall come, shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. So the Roman legions destroyed the city and the sanctuary in 70 AD. So if you're looking for a Messiah, it was somebody that was killed prior to 70 AD. 
And we have, obviously, a very interesting candidate to propose. The presentation of the Messiah of Israel will become so vivid to us in Isaiah 53 that the Ashkenazi Jews tried to remove Isaiah 53 from their book of Isaiah, but the Sephardic Jews did not. And what really is the embarrassment to them is when the Dead Sea Scrolls were found in 1948, one of the great treasures was a complete copy of the book of Isaiah. And guess what? Right in the middle of it all, sandwiched between what we would call chapter 52 and 54, guess what is 53? It's staring them right in the face. Be prepared next time. Book of Isaiah, presenting the suffering servant, the role of Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach. There are two roles. The first role is a suffering servant, and we will understand it like we've never understood it after going carefully through Isaiah 53. He will describe it with all the eloquence and all the attention of detail that you could. It's almost a summary of all of Paul's epistles in Isaiah. But the Bible also talks about him coming to proclaim the day of vengeance of our God. The Jesus Christ that is going to fulfill that mission is a very different Jesus Christ than most people visualize. We're not talking about the sun-tanned carpenter's son walking along the Sea of Galilee, patting the kids on the head, telling you to turn the other cheek. And Isaiah is also going to present him drenched in the blood of his enemies when he goes to fight for the remnant. We'll have a whole different perspective of what I'll call the Armageddon sequence from Isaiah than you get anywhere else. Boy, the Old Testament, I strongly encourage you to make a commitment to yourself to master the Old Testament. Most Christians learn the New Testament, the Gospels escalate, Paul's epistles are without peer, they're this lot, great. But, master the Old Testament. It's the whole counsel of God. It starts at Genesis 1 and ends at Revelation 22. It's a package, 66 books written by 40 authors in which every detail, every number, every place name is there by design, supernatural design. You can prove it again and again and again. 